Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So last week I asked, does anybody know what today is? I'm going to ask the same thing this week. Does anybody know what today is? It's Sunday. November 8th. Um, tonight we are doing the uh, slideshow from our Israel trip. Um, but I wanted to invite Jeannie, who is finally able to be with us. Um, if she would come up and just share some of the things that God showed her and you know, whatever God has laid on her heart from the trip to Israel. So, Jeannie. Dave, would you bring the lights up, please? Thank you. Thank you for the shofar call this morning. Whoever blew that, Nathan? Nathan. Good job. I spilled my water, so, and I've got Lori's coffee cups, and the Holy Spirit is with me. <laughs> so, um, I wrote these notes, how long have we been there? This is the fourth? I don't know. Okay, You're good. Me I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad you don't know, because I don't either. Um, I just wanted to share a bit about our trip. Um, if you didn't know that a trip to Israel was a pilgrimage, you certainly find out. <laughs> um, a trip from Montana is, uh, what did we fly? Five hours, and we probably had a couple hours in airports. So by the time you get to New York, you've already put in um, say an eight hour day, well, probably more than that because we were up at 3.30 or 4.30 to get to the airport. And then you have to find your way around either JFK or whatever is there that you fly into and, um, and prepare yourself for a 10 hour flight. And um, my uh, first observation is, uh, God has to put it in you <laughs> uh, to make the trip. And, but when he puts it in you, you better go. Um, because he has a purpose in it uh, for you and for others. Um, So we first encountered, we enco well, we encountered before we left. Dennis and I were having a lot of physical problems, which continued through the trip. Mine got better, his didn't. Um, but I certainly felt <laughs> the prayers of especially my ladies who prayed for me because I can hardly walk. <laughs> I was a gimpy person. Um, but I made it through, and oddly enough, the, the steps that I was the most worried about was the upper room steps. <laughs> Those were the easiest of what we went through this time. We had a trip. We made many, many steps and many, many stops. Um, and you're absolutely dog tired when you get there. So you just kind of fall over and fall into bed. <laughs> but it's up at six the next morning. Chop, chop, let's go. We got things to do, places to go, and things for you to learn. So, but the one thing that I could take away from all of this is that when God calls, He equips. So, even though you are not feeling <laughs> like you can take another step, you can take another step. Because God has called you to do this. So, we did. Um, this was our fifth trip. Uh, 23 years ago, uh, in 1993, God called us to go. Uh, I remember so clearly the seat I was sitting in our living room and where Dennis was sitting when he said, so, I'm thinking we should take a trip. Where would you like to go? And I'm pretty sure he was thinking like Mexico or Hawaii. And I said, I want to go to Israel. And we had, that had to go in and settle. Mm -hmm. in his spirit. But he come around and said, yes, let's go to Israel. So um, on our return, as I said, it's a difficult trip. 
on our return, we said, we're not doing that again. Are you kidding me? That is so much work. Uh, my feet and my legs were swelled. We were so tired. We'd never been that tired in our lives. We said, well, we won't do that again. That was, that was nice. That was interesting. But two years later, God calls us again. Um, and when we returned, uh, we took friends with us. That seems to have been God's call on us, is to, um, you're going, take somebody with you. There are others that need to know this stuff. And so we took, um, I think, two friends with us from another congregation. And then um, in 2001, God called again. And we had already made our trip plans. There were um, about seven of us, no, five of us going. And 9-11 happened. We were scheduled to go in October, just like this time, but 9-11 happened and people dropped out of the, the trips. <laughs> so <clears throat> when we got to Israel, we, we kind of looked at each other, talked about it. I remember cooking at the stove and going, you know, we're still going, right? And we said, oh, yeah, we're going. Okay, we're going. And uh, when, we, bef when we were standing in line to go through the grueling thing that they put you through in order to get on an Israeli airline, because they're going to know you inside out. They have already, uh, what do you call it nowadays, uh, where they look at you, uh, profile. profile. They have profiled you. They watch your body movements, they watch everything. So by the time you get up to uh, the stand, you're not done. They're going to jerk just about everything they can out of you. And truthfulness <laughs> is the thing, be truthful. So um, we were standing in, in uh, the line in New York in 2001 and there were some elderly Jewish uh, family that was saying goodbye to their daughter, I think it was, because she was having to go back to a, a, a settlement that was, well, settlement, it's Israel's, it, but they call it settlements. But it was in a, a, a contested area. And, uh, she, and she, when she got picked up at the airport, would be picked up by an armored car so that she could drive through the area to get safely to her village. And this older couple looked at us, uh, standing there, all excited about going to Israel, and said, why are you going? <laughs> because we love Israel and we love the Jewish people. And they said to Dennis and I, they said, you're better Jews than we are. Uh, okay, thank you, I'll take that. <laughs> um, so after that trip, then we were called back in 2005. We took Viv and Sally with us. Bless their little pre picking hearts. Um, it was a great trip. We learned much. And as time went on, I'm thinking, you know, probably that's the last time we'll be going. You know, we're 70. And, um, but no. Uh, God called us again, and um, we have gone under great um, opposition, and, but um, during the time, as sick as my husband is now and has been in these last few weeks, I know it's only God's grace that got him through this, and he has said that since. He says, as sick as I am now, surely God was propelling me through that. And so we know that God sustained us <clears throat> and kept us to go. It was a good, it was just a blessing to go with Glenn and Christy and TJ to see more watchmen on the wall being developed, being trained by God, to take up the cause for Israel and her people, not an easy people to love. They can be rude, they're very forthright. Um, but the Bible says, um, it's to the Jew first. The, the Lord, when he came, because God is a God of order, he come to the Jew first. There, Jesus, come out of the Jews. 
And he's never given up that covenant with his people. That still stands. It's yet to be fulfilled, but it still stands. Um, so we're called to be watchmen, uh, to take up the cause for people, for Israel and her people. Um, but I'm called to love what God loves. And um, sometimes that's not easy. Sometimes that's not easy. We know that just being in uh, uh, amongst brothers and sisters in the Lord, you know. <laughs> that you can have your tough times. But the thing I know is that God loves his people, Israel. Um, and um, this time I was absolutely amazed at the hordes of visitors. In as difficult times it is, as it has been uh, for Israel, there were lines of buses as big as ours, the big buses, tour buses, Hordes of people. I talked to Chinese, and we talked to Venezuelan, and we talked to Mexican, and we talked to German. And I mean, it was just the church from around the world um, have woke up. And in my imagining of what it was like of the feast days, the three required feast days that uh, the Jews were required to go up to Jerusalem. That's what I could see in my head were these this hordes of people coming up to honor the Lord, to worship him in the place that he designated for himself. Um, so after we arrived, we had one night in Netanya, and then we traveled, uh, and Netanya is on the coast, uh, north and what, slightly uh, east of Tel Aviv. And then we traveled to the Galilee and had two nights there, a boat ride on the Sea of Galilee and a time of singing and worship. And that was so, such a blessing for me. Uh, <clears throat> for one thing, the boat was owned and piloted and, and um, the serv servant of us was a Messianic Jew. A man who loved Jesus, and he wrote songs, <laughs> and he sings, and it was glorious. Um, we did a quick by, uh, drive by at Nazareth, which um, just when you, when I think of, well, this trip was a real eye opener for me as to the uh, the enemy coming against the Jewish nation. Uh, we did a quick by at, drive by at Nazareth. I, I felt the darkness there. We then spent a couple of what I call interesting hours in Bethlehem. We had not been able to go into Bethlehem in 2001 and 2005 because no guide was going to take the chance <laughs> to take you into Bethlehem. But but as things go in that world, they, have, they will certify a Jewish guide. He has to have the Arab permission to be able to come into their territory. And we had one of those. <clears throat> and he took us in, and we had to have uh, on our bus, because our, our um, guide drawer was not certified, we had to have a Palestinian, an, an Arab an Arab man um, who was certified to be a guide, and he got on our bus. And I told Chrissy and Glenn later, I said, you know, uh, for me, the, the meaning of that whole time in Bethlehem was chaos. Mm -hmm. The man's attitude was chaotic, his speech was chaotic, everything around was chaotic. We were going to go into, I don't remember exactly what the cave was. Uh, okay. Thanks, Shepherd's Grotto. And the Jewish guide had just taken his bus in, and then he come out and he's looking at us, and I don't know if the look on our face was not good, but he goes. <laughs> <laughs> so we go. <laughs> so we go in <clears throat> and come out, and um, thank God we had some pictures taken in Bethlehem. 
um, of, the, of the five of us there because, you know, it's been a long time since we've been there. 2000 and, or uh, 95 was the last time we were there. Yeah, 95. And, and in 95 was when the, the um, Jewish government was required, required by the world, to give this portion over to the Arabs. Now, you might, if you, if you listen to me talk about Arabs and, and you pick up a tone of resentment, you could be right. Um, but I also know that God extends grace and mercy to every human being. We have the choice, they have the choice. I also know by studying the book of Obadiah and the book of Amos that they're gonna keep a hard heart. There will be some that come out that, like Pastor Drury, Curry, Pastor Curry that we listened to in um, Bethlehem. And believe me, they're just like a Jewish person. When they come to see the Messiah, they're on fire. It's like they, God has lit in them a fire, and they can't stop talking about him. Good stuff, really good stuff. So anyway, we left Bethlehem. Probably, I'm going to say, three-ish, four-ish in the afternoon, something like that. The very next morning, we see on the news that the Arabs have declared a day of rage. And the stabbing of the Jews starts. And uh, at wherever they can, can do it. Um, so again, what struck me while we were in Bethlehem was the sense of darkness. I don't remember how the world designates it, if it's like zone one or zone one. So no Jew is, light, is allowed to go in unless licensed to do so. And of course you wouldn't go in because you'd be dead if you were a Jew. Uh, rem uh, just remember, <laughs> this is their land. This is their land. Um, the Old Testament gives the description. This belongs to them. But the world has said, no, 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 you must give peace. I mean, you, in order to have peace, P-E-A-C-E, -E, you must give P-I-E-C-E, -E, peace. And so they've been doing that. But uh, that reminded me of Joel 3, 1 through 3, which says, For behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, then I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people, my people, the Jews, and my inheritance, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. So you just learn to rest. You learn to rest in <clears throat> what God is doing. Because the Jews have to be brought to that place of where they're going <laughs> to really see that they missed it 2,000 years ago. So the next four nights were in Jerusalem, and there I had a real sense of the creeping darkness that was coming in um, on the Jewish nation, because then this, this knife thing, you know, and they're, they're, the, the Arabs are showing their people how to kill them with a the knife, so you don't have guns, and uh, we'll kill them with knives, and they are, they're taking knives out of their kitchens, and they're going to kill the Jews. Um, it just felt like black tentacles coming in to choke the Jews. Um, at the same time, I'm realizing <clears throat> that they bring God's judgment upon their own heads by rejecting uh, Yeshua, Jesus. I also realize there is a day coming in which they, the Jews, and all but the Jews will say, Baruch haba v'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I also realized that Jesus came for the whole world, not just the Jews, but he did come for the Jew first and also the Greek, Romans 1.16. Our God's a God of order, and thus he proclaimed it. And we, the church, are grafted in, Romans 11. About the second day in uh, Jerusalem, um, I personally felt that the mantle of the burden of responsibility of taking people, let's go and come go with me, 
uh, has been passed. <laughs> um, I, I honestly feel that it has been set on Glenn and Christy. Not that I'm going to keep, not going to remind you about the importance of Israel in God's plan. Not that I'm going to give up on talking about it. You've heard me talk about it incessantly if you've known me for years. <laughs> um, but the burden of, of um, saying to others, come, let's go. Let's go up to Jerusalem. I really feel like has been laid on Glenn and Christy. And um, their response has been, I mean, they were just soaking stuff up. And when I said that to them, they didn't flinch. They didn't flinch. I thank God for giving this great privilege and the grace <laughs> to go to Israel these five times. Um, to have in our minds and hearts the people and the places of Israel, of the Israel, and about whom Zechariah 2 says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, After glory he has sent me against the nations, which plunder you, you, Israel. For he who touches you, the Jews, touches the apple of his eye. Genesis 12.3 was very, very uh, convicting to me 20 little years ago. And um, I will bless those who bless you, he says to Abraham, and I will curse those who curse you. And when you look at the original language, the first curse is I will curse those who curse you. Um, the, those who curse even slightly get the harsh curse. From God and it's because he has sent Abraham out Abraham and his family out to do a job and um, we as the grafted in have our own job to do and our own job is to read the words of this thing this Bible believe them <laughs> believe them when it talks about Israel when it talks about the Jews when it talks about the Middle East it's not America guys it's Israel-centric, God-centric, Israel-centric, Jewish-centric, Jesus-centric. Um, and then we wander away from that. We lose our path. We lose, our, we lose track. And then we start coming up with these other things. So anyway, I uh, just want to mention a couple of things. There were two places in Israel this time that really got to me. The, the first one was uh, the Friends of Zion Heritage Center in Jerusalem, which was quite a media thing. But at the very end, they told us to put out our hands because there was going to be a light. I didn't know what was that. I was all about put out my hands, and we all did. And then reflected in my hands was the name of a Jew. Um, heavy for me because I am to be praying for them as a people. I am to be praying for them even by name if I know them if they're not saved. And so uh, that was one of those boom things. And the other place was the pit. Um, again, the first time I could swear I saw the f where, where if a man was hanging there, like they believed Jesus was probably chained, that you know they would leave the oils off of their body on the walls. Wow, that was powerful. Was about 2001, I think. This time, it was like, okay, being in the pit. We're in the pit. And we had light in there. There would have been no light when Jesus was in there waiting um, to be taken out. That was the Caiaphas house. Uh, to be taken away and crucified for my sins. So, anyway, those are my observations. Um, I thank God that he got us there and that he got us home again. What a blessing. And I thank God, too, for Glenn and Christie and um, what they learned and what God has expectations. You don't realize it when you first start, but 
and I was a dummy. I had not what's this about, but he has expectations for us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Very important stuff. Okay. <clears throat> Just to tag on to that, fall of 2017, <clears throat> start saving your pennies and dollars because we are looking to go back October of 2017, okay? Um, I could spend the rest of the time talking about what God showed us. I'm, I'm hoping to do that in greater detail tonight. Um, <clears throat> some of you are very much like I was four or more years ago. I grew up in a church that was replacement theology. Israel no longer has a place the church is now Israel. <clears throat> and it took God <clears throat> quite some doing to open my eyes to the truth of his word. Okay? We look at this, and somewhere in the recesses of our brain, we're convinced this is an American book. It just happened to Americans overseas. And we, we have this concept that... Um, like, like Jeannie said, it's American-centric. And we always read the news and look at it in light of Scripture with America as the center, but it's not the center. The center is Israel, and, and really the center is Mount Zion, the Temple Mount, okay? And 95% of the authors and the people that are, are being discussed in here are Jewish, including... Jesus. Jesus didn't quit being a Jew on the cross. Okay? Jesus, the incarnate God, was a Jew. Okay? Paul never considered himself anything but a Jew. He didn't go, oh, I've forsaken all my Judaism because I now have freedom. I'm going to found the Christian church. No. No. As a matter of fact, he said, I would rather I died that my people would live. That my people might be saved. Romans uh, 9, 10, and 11. He deals specifically with that mindset that the Jews are out. Okay? <clears throat> when God started getting a hold of me, it was interesting. I like to travel from room to room in my house. That's about it. Maybe out on the deck on a nice day. Okay? Christy says, you know, we've got to go to Hamilton. It's like, she says, we've got to go to Missoula. It's like, oh. Okay, any further than that, it's like, i got to build myself up. About two and a half years ago, God really started birthing in me a desire to go to Israel. And it's, that's completely 180 degrees from where I was. Because I had zero desire to ever go to Israel. And God started birthing this in me. And it wasn't enough that Christy and I go, I was absolutely convinced Dennis and Jeannie needed to go. And, you know, when, when the church blessed us with this trip, and, and you will never in this life understand how grateful we are I had no way of knowing how it was going to happen. I just knew God wanted us to go. And then the week we were getting ready to leave, and, and Dennis's back is messed up, and Jeannie's hip is messed up, and I'm, I'm convinced if I have to haul you on my back, you're going. You have to be there. And I think, you know, I have no idea whether Dennis and Jeannie will ever go again, but I know that while they were there, they got to impart to Christian eye the zeal the love that they have because God loves that place and that people. Um, you know, Jeannie says, you know, there are hard people to get to love. I grew up with Italian <coughs> and Irish. Hey, you know, the Jews are pretty mellow. No, nobody spit in my face when they talked. Nobody punched me in the nose to get their point across. Um, so to me, it was okay. Um, 
But we need to remember it's not based on us, it's not based on our culture, it's based on what God in his sovereign right has decided. We don't direct God to follow our path, he directs us to follow his. And so we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray that the Jewish people would come to know their Messiah. They're the people of the book. They had this. It was entrusted to them. The, the uh, patriarchs were entrusted to them. And God will not forsake his promises to Israel. I hate how often people misuse this quote. The gift and the calling are without repentance. God has gifted them and he has called them and he has not turned his back. He has held things up for a time for our sake to bless us. But he will fulfill his promise to Israel. Okay? And, and people, there's a time coming very quickly. If you have not already reached it, it will come quickly in your life where you are going to have to decide, will I stand there or will I stand there? Because one is going to be in line with God's will despite the insanity. Because I tell you what, some of the things that Israel does, I go, what are you doing? You're making the whole world hate you. Uh, well, that's kind of because God said that would happen. Okay? That's what it's going to take to break them so that they can receive the fulfillment of their promise. God will break them, and a remnant of a remnant will be saved. But God is true to his word. Okay? So, you know, you can, you can follow the way of the Christian church from about 300 A.D. up until recently where they want to expunge the Jewishness out of this book. They want to expunge the Jewishness out of this faith. You can go that way. And, and I believe you're saved. I, I don't question that you will go to heaven. But you have missed the fullness of what God has done and is doing and will do. Okay? So, tonight, 7 o'clock, we'll go over the slides. You'll get to see a lot of the things Jeannie talked about. Um... I have no idea how long it'll be. When we did it with the kids, it was three hours. But, but, we had 1,080 pictures. Tonight we have... 326. So, divide that by a third. So we're looking at about an hour-ish. Okay? And, and that's if you guys don't ask questions. So, um, and we did get some of the worship from the, the Sea of Galilee boat. We, we got a little bit of that. Uh, and you'll get to hear that um, tonight. So if you have your Bibles, open up to uh, Psalm. Um, well, first, let's go to 122. I, I need to share something with you from Psalm 122. <clears throat> When we were um, in Israel, one of the days that we were there, um, we were at, it was actually the day that we went to uh, Caiaphas' house. And uh, I was standing, and, and we have some pictures of it. I was, I was just amazed at how close everything was. Okay, I, I look to my left, I'm looking east, and on my left there's the, the Temple Mount, and then there's Mount Scopus, and then there's... Uh, the Mount of Olives, and then the, the Mount of Scandal, and then off to the right we have the Mount of Evil Council, um, and, and it's all just <clears throat> right there. And somebody made a comment about Israel being compact, and, and Christie actually said Psalm 122. And since that day, there's not been a day that goes by that I don't read Psalm 122. I just keep putting this into my spirit. I just want to share this with you. I, I actually almost read this this morning with, with the reading. Psalm 122 is a song of ascents of David. Now, you guys realize that the title there is actually part of the psalm. Okay, it's actually like verse 1a. Okay, so don't, don't just skip over that because that's important. A song of ascents of David. Um, the song of ascents, when the Jews would come up to the temple... We talked about the, the narrow steps and the broad steps, okay? <clears throat> when they come up to the southern entrance, they would go up the steps and they were staggered, so you could not run up them, 
okay? Um, they would have like two short steps and then a broad step, and then one short step and a broad step, and then maybe three short steps. But the idea was you took your time, and as you came to a broad step, you would stop, and you would sing one of the Psalms of Ascent, or you'd spend time in prayer. You were ascending up into the Temple Mount. This is a Psalm of Ascent, a song to sing as you're going up. Okay, so when you read this and you go, oh, a song of ascent, you don't just disregard it. You know this is, was, was written with the intent that as you are coming into the temple of God, the place where God has made his residence, you are singing this as you go up. Okay, so um, a song of ascent of David, and David sings. He says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Okay, that right there caught me. Because... Um, how often are we glad to go to church? How often are, are we pumped because we get to go to church? And how often do we go, oh, I could have slept in today. Oh, the pastor's going to talk so long. They're probably going to sing that song again. That one song. Uh, just so you know, if you want to hear the happy song, go somewhere else. I hate the happy song. Uh, Trevor, every time he got up there, he would sing that the happy song because he knew I'd be cringing. I'm not singing that, Trevor. I'm not singing the happy song. Okay? But the idea that David is conveying here is, is I was glad. I, I, this is something I'm anticipating. I'm looking forward to. And, and when we say, hey, let's go to church, our, our response, if our hearts are right, if we are understanding rightly the things of God, our hearts should be glad. Okay? Um, our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together. Uh, other translations, the NIV actually says, built compactly together. Okay? Um, it's small. And, and you think about this, when God chose Abraham, he chose one man out of a nation. He, he chose one man that he would build through him a mighty nation for himself. Okay? And, and he had this plan that he was going to take this people, he was going to settle them. I mean, Israel is not a big country. I would look at the map and I'd go, okay, we're in Jerusalem. We're going down to Masada. That's about that big. Oh, that should take us about an hour and a half. I'm, I could take a nap. And about the time I settle back in my chair, the bus is stopping. They have a different scale than we have in America. <laughs> because that big on the map from my house to Christopher's house is about three hours. <laughs> and in Israel, it's about 45 minutes. And it took me forever to get used to that. I'm like, okay, we're leaving Tiberias. We're going to go to Jerusalem. This will be some, and, and you want sleep, okay? You do, because you're up at, I mean, things are moving at six, okay? And you come home anywhere from four to seven, and you've been on the go all day, and your brain is active all day. You come home, and you're just like, I want to go to bed. And we didn't, because we're stupid. We stayed up and named all of our pictures so we would know what they were. <laughs> However, evidently my wife was sleeping as she was naming some of them because the, the video that we got of the worship on the Sea of Galilee, she had as baptism in the River Jordan. <laughs> She's like, I, I lost the video, it's gone. <laughs> baptism of the River Jordan. I, I just left it. Um, but it is close-knit. Okay? So, going on. To which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Okay? They're coming together. They're going up to the mountain. Because God has told them to. And they're going to give Him thanks. The thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Okay? And then this is what he's praying. This is the prayer. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, 
I will seek your good. Okay? Now, I, I've said this before, and, and this, I'm, I'm, I'm going to drill into you and drill into you and drill into you and drill into you until we get the point. Drop the political crap. Okay? Lay that aside for a moment. Okay? You don't have to agree with Israel's politics. Okay? That's irrelevant. God has chosen that place. Okay? Uh, I don't know why. When he chose it, he didn't consult with me. He didn't seek my approval. I mean, we got places here in the valley that are everybody's good. He could have put the Temple Mount up on my hill. That would have been fine. <laughs> I would have been okay with that. But he didn't ask me. Okay? And it's not given to me to question the heart of God as to why things are done. But listen to this prayer. I'm going to read it again. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. And this last part, this is where it really kind of grabbed me. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Okay? For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. I want good for that place because God wants good for that place. Because at some point down the road, God will redeclare, this is mine. Don't matter who's sitting on the top of the mountain. Doesn't matter all the things they did to prevent him from coming back. All of that will be wiped away and it will be his. <laughs> okay? And all the people, they will come up through the valley of Jehoshaphat, the, the Kidron Valley, and he will judge them. Okay? It's called the Valley of Judgment for that reason. So, that's, that's just the small part, okay? I want to go flip over Psalm 107. We're in a season. What season is this, this part of the year? And if anybody says Christmas, just don't. Okay? It's not Christmas yet. What? Yes. Say that out loud, Vivian. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. I thought it was coming season. <laughs> For the hunters, they're, sick. they're giving thanks. It's hunting season. <laughs> it all works together. And, and remember to pray for our hunters. Okay? Pray for their safety. Pray for their success. But according to Dom, success toward the latter part of hunting season. Right? That would be nice. Yeah. So, um, Thanksgiving. I want to read this passage to you, this, this psalm. Okay? And I, I just want to point out some things because we come into Thanksgiving and we, we're so hectic, we're so busy, our lives are so cluttered that a lot of times we, we forget the things we have to be thankful for. Okay? And, and you're going to kind of look at me for a minute as you read some of the psalm, but, but we need to pay attention to the last line of each section. Okay? So we're going to start. This is Psalm 107. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Okay, so we have two reasons right there to be thankful. Okay? He is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. Always, never fails. Okay? So there's two reasons. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble. There's a third reason. God has redeemed you. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay? And gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, and from the north and from the south. Now, this is the start of the first section here. Okay? Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul 
and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Okay, see that? Those last two verses, 8 and 9 there. Let them, who's them? Those that wandered in the wilderness. Their souls were thirsty. They cried out to the Lord, and he answered, and he brought them out of the desert and put them in a safe place. Okay? Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Okay, so here's, we, we see the, the problem, lost in the desert, our soul, uh, Jesus, Jesus says that he is the bread of life and the living water. He that eats of him will never hunger, he that drinks of him will never thirst. It's, it's coming right back to this, this idea right here, okay? So the, the first condition, lost in the desert, they cried out, God delivers them. What's their response? What's their response? They gave thanks. They didn't just go find an apartment in the city and get on with life. They gave thanks. They had something to be thankful for, and so appropriately, they were thankful. Verse 10, this is the second condition. Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons. For they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed their hearts down with hard labor. They fell down with none to help. Kind of gloomy, isn't it? They turn their backs on, on God. They are sitting in darkness in the shadow of death. They're prisoners of affliction. And they're better. They're, they're, they're in bonds. They're chained. Because they turned away from him, he bowed their hearts down with hard labor. Uh, we see a picture of this in uh, the fall of man in, in the Garden of Eden. The curse was that he would have to work for his food, that, that it would not easily yield up food for him. Okay? So, um, hard labor. They fell down with none to help. And that goes back to Ecclesiastes. You travel alone and you fall, there's no one to help you up. But if you travel with a companion, there's someone to help you up. So then, uh, verse 13. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Okay? Keep in mind, let's go back to um, the very first verse. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. These two conditions make everything else in this understandable. Okay? He delivered them from their distress. He's good, and his steadfast love endures forever. Even though they turned their back on him, and he allowed harsh things to come on them, and he put things on them, when they turned to him, what did he do? He delivered them. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. I love that. God didn't just take a key and unlock it and, and set it to the side. He shattered the bonds. Okay? Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he shatters the doors of bronze and cuts in two the bars of iron. Okay? This is the result. Okay? We see the condition, we see the turning, we see God respond, and then there's always a result that is, is incumbent on us. It says, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, okay? For his wondrous works to the children of man. And then what did he do? He shattered the doors of bronze and he cuts into the bars of iron. So that's our second one, those that have turned their back on him. Then we have another one here in verse 17. Some were fools. Now, do you, you understand the way the Hebrew uses the word fool? Okay? It's not someone that's just silly. Okay? It's not even someone that's just dense. The, the word fool indicates someone that is, is inclined to evil. They've lost their moral sense. Okay? It's always with the understanding that it's based on wisdom is following in God and foolishness is turning your back on him. Okay? So when, when you see fool used, especially in the Psalms and in Proverbs, this is the context in which it's almost always used. Some were fools through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. 
Okay? The condition. Because of their sinfulness, their, their choice, okay? their sinful ways, they chose to do these things. They suffered affliction. They didn't want to eat. Nothing looked good to them anymore. They drew near to the gates of death. Then, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Do you see what, what's going on here? He gives them what they need. These people that have turned and they've, they've fallen into sin, they need his word. They need to know the fool needs to understand how to be wise. So God gives them his word. And that healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Okay? This whole idea, you see, you've talked about this idea before. When we are in sin, we are running headlong to the precipice that will drop us into hell. All right? And that's what's going on here. But God has delivered them when they call out, God, my life stinks. I need more. I need something other than what I have. He responds. He delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word. They were healed. What's their response? Let them. Come on. Thank you. Thank the Lord. Let them thank the Lord. For his steadfast love. For his wondrous works to the children of man. You guys kind of getting a theme here? And let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his deeds in songs of glory. You realize that's what we're doing when we sing praise and worship songs, right? It, it, I spent a lot of years thinking that when I was singing praise and worship songs, it was kind of inward. It was me and God. And that's, that's a good place to be. But when we're actually vocalizing it, we are speaking forth the glory of God. Okay? And I want it such that when we sing in this church, people walking by on the street go, oh, what is that? They're singing awesome things of their God. I want to know about this God. I don't want us to be, you know, the church mice choir. And I want it loud. Okay? I want it loud because we have a lot to praise our God for. Okay? Now that's one of the things, folks. Um, Benj, I'm going to use you as an example, okay? Okay. Benjamin likes loud music. I don't mostly like loud at all. Okay? Um, loud kind of clutters my senses. But before God, we not only sing, we shout. Okay? And, and if you are too afraid to be loud, then you're not worshiping the same God that I am. Okay? Because one of these days, not only are we going to shout, but we're going to dance. Okay? Um, we, we had the opportunity to dance at uh, Ben and Kate's wedding. And uh, Christy and I were dancing, and after we were done, I uh, was talking with Thaddeus, and he said, you guys didn't dance, you just hugged and moved. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> you know? Not that. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I think I threw something out. <laughs> but I want to dance. David danced. Where I don't care what anybody around me is thinking. Where I want to just pour out to God. I want my entire being to be about giving him praise. And I don't care what any of you think. Okay, that's where I want to get to. That's where I want to go. Okay? So, <clears throat> let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his deeds in songs of joy. Songs of joy. And we have the fourth. Okay? Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. 
For he commanded and raised... Now, think about this for just a minute. Okay? They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. They're, they're talking about some awesome, incredible things. Now, when we think about awesome, incredible things, we tend to think about Jesus calming the storm. But what are they describing here? The storm. It says... They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep, for he commanded and raised the stormy winds, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. Okay. Uh, how, uh, you, any of you guys seen that movie, The Perfect Storm? Mm -hmm. And you remember the waves, and they're like going straight up, only to get to the top and go straight down? <clears throat> I'm good in ankle deep water. When I see things like that, I, I'm not interested. Okay? We don't get a lot of that around here in western Montana. And I'm okay with that. So his awesome deeds was, was the creation of this storm. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. I can relate to that. Okay? They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wit's end. They have no idea. Well, what do we do? Okay. Had these people sinned? Are these like the, the, the previous two? Had they turned their back on God? No, they're just going about life. They're doing their jobs. And things come upon them. Things happen. Storms happen. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet. He brought them to their desired haven. Okay? They started off, everything looks great, storm of life comes. Looks like they are despairing of life. If nothing else, they're really sick to their stomach. <laughs> their courage has failed. They don't know what to do. Okay. They call out to him. He answers them. He stills the storm. He hushes the waves. They were glad that the waters were quiet. You think that's an understatement? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's good. The you know, storm went by and things are cool now. They were glad that the waters were quiet and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. This is us, folks. Okay, right, right here. Do you see, in each one of these cases, when they are giving thanks, they are not doing it just to themselves. Okay? They're extolling it. They're, they're shouting it out. They're telling people, man, you, you know what God did for me? Let me tell you about the storm of life that I was in, that he delivered me from, that he reached down to me, and he calmed the storm, and he stilled the waters, and he rescued me, and he delivered me to a safe place. So then we go on, and, and the, the, four, the four different examples are done, and we're, we're wrapping this up. He says, he turns rivers into a desert, springs of water into a thirsty ground. Well, that doesn't sound good. Well, if you are in a, in a place where your contentment comes from the waters and not from God, and you're looking to the things of this life to bring you satisfaction, this is very good. Why? Because of the next verse. Um, he goes a fruitful land into the salty waste because of the evil of its inhabitants. Okay, see, this is not, God's not just slapping people down because he, you know, I don't have anything to do today. Well, let's find Glenn. It's always fun to knock him down. Okay. Then look at verse 35. He turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water. And there he lets the hungry dwell, and they establish a city to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. By his blessing, they multiply, multiply greatly, and he does not let their livestock diminish. When they are diminished and brought low through oppression, evil, and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes and makes them wander in trackless wastes. But he raises up the needy out of affliction and makes their families like flocks. Okay, so see that there's a, a, a whole circular thing that's going on here. Okay, without God, we are like those evil princes. 
And we may have goods in life for a while, but God's going to bring us to a point of bankruptcy. Sometimes, literally, financially. Sometimes it's just a point we come to in our lives and we go, I, I can't go on anymore. What are you talking about? Your life is good. Man, you got everything you want. Your, your peers respect you. Your wife loves you. Everything's going well in your life. Yeah, it's, there's just a hole. And I've thrown everything in my life into that hole and it's not filling up. Okay? So when they come to that point, when they come to that low place, God raises them up. He blesses them. And then look at 42. Okay? Because see, a lot of times when I read this, I go through and I think 42 is referring to the people in 41, but I don't think that's the case. I think actually 42 are those in the body that see God reaching in and pulling somebody up. And they're bearing witness to the incredible redemption of God at work in somebody's life. So the upright see it and are glad, and all wickedness shuts its mouth. Whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. Let him consider the steadfast love of the Lord. Okay? So, I don't know about you. I'm, I'm going to make a general assumption here. Okay? If I'm wrong, come and talk to me afterwards, privately. But I'm going to make the assumption that none of you wants to be fools. Okay, I, I'm, I'm going to make the general assumption that everybody in this room wants to be wise. Okay, so if you want to be wise, give consideration to this entire passage, these different scenarios that have been laid out. Some of the things come on because they don't know him, and it's just life. Some it comes on because they have received something from him and they've turned their back. Some have just willingly, man, they've just indulged in sin. But every time, every case, every scenario, when they call out to God, what happens? He delivers them. And when he delivers them, what is their response? Give thanks. To give thanks. Okay? See, each one of us have been in one of these places. Some of us have been in all of these places. Okay? Some of you might be in one of these places right now. God doesn't give you a problem. He never presents you a problem without presenting you the answer. Okay? So if you're in a storm of life and your boat's going up and down, you're bound and in darkness, you've come to the point where nothing in this life satisfies you, you're wandering through a desert, you're just in a dry time. Every single one of those has the same answer. Call out to God. Call out to Him. Don't go with reservation. God, I want you to take me this far. I'll give you, okay, I, I, I will present to you X if you'll get me out of this trouble. The only time that ever works is when X equals everything. Okay? X equals everything. If you want to save your life, you've got to lose it. Lose it. Okay. We've gone a little over today. I apologize. Father, I ask, Lord God, that you establish in our hearts hearts of thanksgiving. Father, that we would be a people that live with an attitude of thanksgiving. Father, that the first thing that comes out of our mouth would be praise. Regardless of the situation, the first thing that comes out of our mouth is praise because of what you're done, or Father, praise because of what we know you're going to do. Help us, Father, to honor you, keeping afresh in our minds all that you have done. Father, you have redeemed us. You have made a way in the desert. You have broken our bonds. Father, you have filled us with good things. You have satisfied our souls. And Father, you delivered us from the storm. <coughs> Help us, Father, be mindful. And as we engage this season, Father, with, with thanksgiving, Father, let's replace the turkeys. Let's replace the pumpkin pies. Let's replace all of that mindset with true hearts of thanksgiving. Giving you praise, honor, and glory for all that you have done for us. And I ask beyond that, Father, I ask that you would open our eyes to see 
those things that we're blind to, the ways that you've blessed us that we don't even know. And help us, Father, to rejoice in the others that are being delivered as well. That the upright will see it. We thank you, Father. We bless your name, in Jesus' name.